And we're officially live, loving it, live from Stockade Martial Arts in Kingston. I'm right here with Chris Terminator Mouseri, Lion Fight, K1, Glory Kickboxing veteran. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? Always well, always well. The fans want to know what you're going to do April 21st. Come Lion Fight 41 or 2 or whatever the event is. I think it's 42. Uh, regardless of the number, though, I'm coming to knock this guy out. So, <laughs> All right. We're just kidding. Me and Chris uh, are good friends that have trained out in Thailand. We've trained out here in the States as well. Um, you might know him from Nakamwe Nation. You might know him from fighting on K1 Grand Prix. You might know him from fighting on Glory Kickboxing, Lion Fight. I mean, he's done it all in – uh, has fought some of the OGs here on the East Coast on Warriors Cup, Friday Night Fights, all the old school promotions. Uh, he even fought one of my old uh, trainers. So, yeah, we, ha- we have a long <laughs> history of not knowing each other and now knowing each other. So it's pretty exciting, man. It, it, it's good to be training alongside each other. Um, I was I was a fan before just of your technique and just knowing your background in gymnastics. And obviously it shows in your style. Um, I think it's so much more beneficial, especially um, now that you're getting back to Muay Thai. So for some, some of the people that didn't know, uh, Chris has been more on the kickboxing side for the past couple of years. And now he's making a return to Muay Thai after a slight layoff. So why don't you go over just, I guess, the steps of your career from when you started to get everyone else cut up since I'm cut up myself. What was that? You cut out for a second. Um, just right. going over some of the steps of your uh, career in the past couple of years, um, just catching everyone up since we made the transition from kickboxing to Muay Thai and now yeah. coming back to Muay Thai. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was signed with Lion Fight and I uh, had a four fight deal with them. So <clears throat> I was there for a little bit, uh, had some good fights and some some good wins. And, you know, I fought Kevin Ross, Coach Junawat, and uh, – then I got the opportunity to go fight in K1. So after my contract ended, I ended up switching over to kickboxing. Not as like a permanent switch, just uh, it kind of came my way and I wanted to stay busy and it was a huge opportunity. So fought over in K1, ended up losing to uh, Ilias Boulade, or I think that's how you say his name, in the first round of the tournament. Um, had a little bit of a mixed run with Glory. I'm two and two with them. And uh, when my contract ended, uh, Lion Fight got in touch with us, and I was excited to get back to Muay Thai. So now I'm getting back to what I really like to do. It's great sport. keeps you busy, but uh, Muay Thai is really what I love to do, and I'm I'm happy to be back uh, with Lion Fight, and uh, I'm excited to go. I feel like, especially your style, just being able to keep balance on everything you throw. When I tell people to study fighters, And it's kind of great that you're a friend of mine because I can just toss up a lot of the videos for them to look at just for an example of what technique should look like offensively, defensively. It seems like you're almost never in out of position. Like you're always over your hips, always centered over your hips, never too far back, never too far forward, falling over your toes and your feet. And I think that's a great example for people that are coming up. You might be a little bit too tough for your own good sometimes. <laughs> uh, and I think that's that was the big uh, thing in K1 and uh, Glory is, is that you really like to stay there in the pocket when in uh, Muay Thai, if guys like to press in while you're pressing in, uh, sometimes they're running into elbows and running into knees, kind of like uh, Nick Chastain did in that lion fight. Yeah, you know, the the lack of elbows and uh, the difference in the clinching and knees and stuff really changes the game and the the pacing of the fight. Like, it's a totally different sport. So uh, for me, it was a little bit of a a tricky adjustment with my style, you know. Um, And I don't know if kickboxing rules are really best suited for me. I I still like to do it. And if the opportunity came up again, I'd probably take another Glory or K1 fight. But I think the Muay Thai rules really, you know, suit the the style that I like to fight, the pace that I fight, and uh, just the things that I like to do. I love throwing elbows. I love to clinch. I like having options. And, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely my sport. I feel like they've never given you a break, man. (laughs) Like when it when it all the way from (laughs) fights and Warriors Cup, uh, just a lot more experienced opponents. And then especially when you got into 
K1 and Glory. What was one of the opponents? Like 142 and twos. Like it was the craziest record I have ever seen in my life. I thought Petrosian was impressive. Yeah, something nuts like that. I think he was like 150 wins and only a couple losses. You know, most of his wins by knockout. But uh, yeah, I'm just always the guy. They they call me up or they send me a contract and I don't even watch. I just sign. I don't need to see it. I'm like, ah, you know, whoever it is, I'm going to fight him. JJ, my coach, yells at me, tells me to watch a video. I tell him to fuck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so do, do you do any kind of studying of your opponents and just breaking them down? Or do you just more focus on your own technique and what you're going to do to them and kind of adapt throughout the fight? Um, for most of my career, I've just focused on my own technique. Uh, I really tried to make a point of being able to adapt throughout the fight. Although, you know, if you watch most of my fights, they, they tend to go the same way, whether that's because I'm not adapting or because I'm good at kind of implementing my game plan, you know, you can decide. But uh, I, I have recently started watching a little more video. You know, I try and at least pick out some patterns and see what guys are good at. I'm just trying to be a, a little less stubborn and a little bit smarter of a fighter than I was coming up. You know, I was just a hard-headed, like, you know, walk forward and fight aggressively. And, uh, you know... I'm just trying to add watching your opponents on some level as a part of that and probably helpful. So I'm giving it a shot. I feel like I'm starting to get into that uh, myself. I, I feel like I've always been more of an adaptive fighter in the past and it helped me out. But I feel the higher of a level that you get to, uh, things change. And I feel like my opponents are able to study me. I feel like this last fight, um, Especially, I, I know that Troy was able to kind of dissect everything, especially being part of the Nakamwe Nation <laughs> and being able to have access to all the content and everything like that. Um, you know, I break myself down a lot. So uh, being so public with all my fights, being so public with um, not only my victories, but my downfalls and showing my holes and what I'm improving upon. Obviously, in my head, as I show it, I'm already working on it months in advance. So I'm picturing it as something that like, oh, this is what you're looking at and this is what you expect, but I'm going to give you something different. But you can also see different patterns within that. Do, do you think about that at all as well? Yeah, I've thought about the same thing. I mean, there's there's plenty of footage out there, you know, of me and you, and especially with everything on Knock More Nation. So I, I've thought in the past about, um, you know, guys being able to, to see that and, and kind of come up with a plan. Uh, but I've always thought it was on them to deal with, you know, whatever I'm doing at the time and things change. But these days I, I kind of feel the same as you. I think like the higher the level, the more it's worthwhile to break people down ahead of time and try and, you know, look for patterns yourself and exploit things. Because if, if you're trying to adapt, you know, right on time in the heat of the moment in a fight and the other guy is a good fighter and they're adapting too, sometimes you're going to miss out. So you might miss some opportunities that had you planned a little better that you probably could have capitalized on. So, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see the, the value in it. I think a lot of the best fighters probably have always watched tape and uh, it's probably a good idea. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, I, I'm doing it, but I don't really like doing it. I, I'm just making myself. So, <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're kind of old school in that sense. And I'm kind of old school. Maybe it comes from me being in Europe for so long and then, uh, well, not so long until I was eight, but I still have a lot of my roots embedded in that. So when it comes to fighting, we just fight. And at the same time, I feel like at a certain point, uh, sometimes the promoters take advantage of that. Sometimes other uh, fighters even take advantage of it, knowing that they have a lot more to gain from you than you know they have to lose. And they might be able to call you out or take you as a easier win, uh, knowing that you're a gamer, you know, that you're going to step up to the plate no matter what, whether there's an injury, whether you're on weight, not on weight, you'll make the weight somehow, you know, and then be able to step in the ring and put up a fight. And once in a while, it feels like it gets taken advantage of. It's like my last whatever number of fights. Um, I, I've had an injury every single one. Like there's no excuses to it at all. but it is it, just a common thing that, oh, this is something that fell out. Oh, let's grab Paul right now. But yeah. it's like you're saved for it. I feel like I've been saved for like those like six days notice. Okay, oh, uh, you're fighting at 185. So I'm putting on weight because the guy was much bigger than me. I'm 192. And then they're like, oh, actually in 17 days, uh, never mind. You're fighting 170 now. 
So it's like, oh, okay. So now 23 pounds to lose in 17 days. Okay, whatever, man. Yeah. I'm just here to fucking fight. I don't care. And I honestly don't care about that. But then once other people made me a little bit more aware, I started to think about it. I'm like, man, maybe you're right. Maybe I just love fighting. I love being in there no matter what. And people sometimes make you realize it's like, man, maybe they're kind of treating you like a sucker. So <laughs> do you uh, feel like you're trying to get smarter about that as well? Man, I'm trying to to be a little bit smarter about that. But, you know, there's a part of me that like I, I just can't turn down a fight. I don't, you know, I don't care who the opponent is, I, uh, you know, what the record is, anything, the timing. I just have a hard time doing it. Uh, I do try and put some faith in my trainer, JJ, though. So, it, you know, yeah. if he timing's bad, um, you know, I was offered, I, I don't know, before uh, Ong Yen Topic fought him, I got offered the fight with Sanchai and I was injured then. I wanted to take it. JJ's like, this is a horrible idea. I'm not letting you do it. And I was like, you know, just sit down, take the night, think about it. I'm game. You know, whatever, whatever happens, happens. And I was like, but yeah, I'll trust your judgment at least this one time, you know. And he, he came back. He's like, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, you're injured. The timing's bad. You know, wait, wait on it. And uh, he was probably right. I probably would have gotten fucked up. You can't, you can't hardly beat a guy like that 100%, much less injured. But, uh, you know, that's just the way that I like to be. I like to take fights. I like to fight. So we came up that way. I think a lot of guys these days are looking for the easier route, and uh, I don't really like the easy route. I, I like the way that, that I've had it so far. I like being that guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to it all because at the same time, maybe if I wasn't on the level that I am like mentally to be able to take those fights, same thing for you, you wouldn't get the call in the first place. You know what I mean? So like we'd be stuck on – you know, just whether it's smaller shows, but just kind of fighting nobodies and never really advancing. So I think throughout this process and taking these fights, it helps you advance that much faster. Um, I mean, you fought guys at such a high level so early on that whenever you fight someone on your level now, and I think that this fight coming up right now in Lion Fight is one of those fights is going to shine through is when you're fighting someone your level and then you're like, all right, look what happens when I fight someone with my experience. Yeah, I think so. You know, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not like being in Thailand where we're training with, you know, top level fighters all the time. And we just have the chance to constantly be pushed in the gym and have our technique. Uh, broken training is done on my own. You know, I, I hit pads with my coach. I don't really have sparring partners. So my biggest opportunity for growth, has always been tough fights and every fight win or lose i learn an incredible amount from each fight and i take it with me and i'm i'm better because of it so i look at it like each uh difficult fight is my biggest opportunity for a learning experience that i can get here you know short of the last year or two i've been able to go to thailand but before that uh it just wasn't something that i could swing so that was really the only way i was kind of advancing myself um friends you know when I when they're close to me in experience, even guys with quite a bit more, but you know, now can keep us. Every time that I've been put against a guy like that, it shows, and I run through them. And uh, I'm planning to do the same this fight. You know, things can always change, but uh, I think that I'm there to you know kind of show up and and show them on that. And then I get to fight guys like that again. But he's a uh, Eric Eric Roca seems like a tough guy and should be good i'm letting the stream settle a little bit but um in the meantime man i was just thinking about this as well is <clears throat> can you hear everything okay mm -hmm. you good on your end yeah it's popping back in now now you, you talked about just being able to take the losses, being able to go from that and, and being excited for the fight coming up now. There was a couple in a row that happened, I think, within Glory, and then there were a few gaps after. How were you able to be resilient? How are you okay with taking these fights? I guess what is going through your mind when you're offered these fights? And then whether you win or you lose them, what happens right after the fight? Because I feel like for myself – Every loss is different. 
I react to it different just based on how I perform and what I did. And then just reflecting on the whole camp, I guess, you know, hindsight's always 20, 20. And then if, if you cheated yourself maybe a little bit, or, you know, you did everything that you can, I guess the result is a little bit different, whether it's a win or a lose. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that a hundred percent for me. Um, you know, I, I like taking tough fights and as long as I, I feel like I put everything I had into training and, um, you know, into fight camp and into the fight. And I know that mentally I showed up and I went for it. I can handle the loss, uh, you know, win, lose, draw, whatever happens. But um, well, losing still kills me. I'm super competitive. Like, I fucking hate losing. Uh, but you have to be able to deal with it and learn and, and progress and just accept the result because – at the end of the day, a fight is a fight, and no matter how well you prepare, uh, what you put into it, and you know, sometimes how much better you are than the other guy, ah, everybody can get caught. You know, you get caught, you have an off night, you know, things happen, injuries, sickness, all these things happen. You know, um, so I just try and roll with it. And like you said, every loss is different. Uh, sometimes, you know, like I'm crushingly disappointed in myself and in the result of the fight. I feel like I didn't perform. Sometimes I'm okay with it. I try my best to be okay with it all the time and just, you know, take it for what it is. But, yeah, they're all different. Um, it's definitely – it's not fun to lose. But it's the no, – I, just... I take. I don't want to always take oh. what I'm going to win, you know. That's, that's not fun either. Yeah, it's what you can control. And I feel like I've been studying the Stoic philosophy a lot lately, and it's – something that I've been passing down to my students, especially those that, you know, get really frustrated with themselves and attach emotion to being able to do the technique right on the first, second, third try. I'm like, like, man, you just do it so easy. And I'm like, yeah, but I do thousands of reps and there's hundreds that I get wrong and I just correct. And I don't sit there for the time that I could spend adding 10 more reps and being like, fuck man, why am I not doing this? Perfect. And yeah. just, there's no attachment. It's like, okay, I, I did that. I didn't feel right. What can I do to fix it? And it seems like you're doing the same exact thing when it comes to the fights. It's like, okay, I did this. I did this. You know, you can attach emotion to it. You can get frustrated. And I think that's a lot of the time where guys kind of fall off. You know, you, they let these defeats eat, eat at them. They let the wins eat at them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, versus just looking at it as, you know, it's part of the process. This is what happened. This is what I could have like objectively done better, physically done better. And this is what I'm going to change when it comes to this fight. That's all I can control. I mean, you were backstage when uh, the last glory event happened at MSG and you know, what, what could I do? Shit happened. I blew out my knee, you know, it's become an issue. And what can I do? I can just fix it. You know, now, uh, we haven't done a podcast since uh, this last glory event. So <laughs> for those that didn't know, um, I was going to be on team USA with IFMA and we're flying out to Cancun, Mexico. And it happened that they gave me a 45 day uh, medical suspension. California is very, very strict. Um, you know, there was no knockdowns, TKO, nothing like that. But anytime you have like, I guess a fight where you're trading blows, a lot of blows, you know, I took hits, I gave hits back. It is what it is. I took a lot of hits. Uh, when it, with, with this cross and then they gave me a 45 day suspension and the tournament was 43 days out so wow. and and i try to fight them about it and you know how they get you know people think they have especially doctors they think they have power over you and like you either sign this or you're just indefinitely suspended so then mm-hmm. you're forced to do it and so you know if what's not happening what what can we do now what do we have in control I'm going to fix my fucking face. I'm going to fix my nose. If you guys can't tell, for every podcast episode, I stare at myself because my face is so asymmetrical looking. It's not because my face is actually asymmetrical. It's because my nose literally curves out so much. I have the same nose as Giorgio Petrosian. So we're both Southpaws. I'm kind of proud of it. But I think he's at the level where he can go on without breathing efficiently. (laughs) I don't, he doesn't expend too much energy, so you know. He's <laughs> I feel like yeah, I got to try a little harder, so I'm gonna fix this fucking thing. When I, when I sat down with the doctor, I was in uh, on the bed. You know, they sit on the other corner of the room, and he was sitting on the other corner of the room. 
And I, I started to explain. I'm like, I think the nose is like a little, he's like, he caught me off. He goes, yeah, I don't even have to come near you. Like he didn't check it whatsoever. He was just sitting on the other side of the room and he's like, oh yeah, it's deviated in two different directions. He's like, I see it from here. <laughs> so yeah, looking forward to, uh, you know, controlling, fixing whatever we can fix and then uh, heading back out to Thailand over there. I know. I saw you reposting some of our stuff. I, I think you're you're feeling a little blue and wanting to go back as well. Yeah, I'm feeling a little froggy. I think I got to get back to Thailand soon. You know, it's been a it's been an interesting go of it back home. So it's about time for another trip. <laughs> How has your experience in Thailand been? Most fixed for the the title of most handsome not nation member. I think we should do a poll on this. We will do a poll, but you gotta wait till I get my Michael Jackson nose done, man. I need to do oh, some. No oh man, I've been showing my friends some of my old pictures when I was a kid to prove it that my nose used to be like. If you look at it sideways, I also have a, I also have like a bump up here. But if you touch it, you know when you run your finger down your shin and there's like those deviations yeah. and bumps, and it's uneven to the left and right. My that's my nose feels like what most snack boy shins feel like. <laughs> <laughs> nose hasn't broken too many times so it's still pretty straight and now yeah, i see enough on there yeah i shattered in this fight because i said that i'm gonna feel like a dick. <laughs> no, I, i'm looking forward to it what has uh been your main focus uh coming up into this fight going back to being able to clinch now have you been able to get good clinch work i know and i feel like thailand is i mean half hour every day twice a day nothing yeah. replaces that in but. thailand it's so much better than than here i mean i have some decent partners a couple guys to work with but i don't get as much in as i like but technically i feel sound i you know it's not too long ago that i was in thailand training uh i always am physically strong in the clinch so I, I feel ready there. I always I always feel like a good, you know, game in the clinch. So uh, even if I'm not getting all the, the clinching in that I want to and the quality of partners, I still feel pretty comfortable there. <clears throat> what has been the main focus throughout the camp coming up into this fight? Um, I know you've been working some southpaw stuff. I, I came up to New York. We, we were able to work some of those techniques. I know you've been uh, pretty excited to uh, kind of show them off. You're looking nasty on pads. That's what uh, Dominic Platt down, uh, downstairs was talking. He's all the way from England, but he's a uh, oh, big you. fan. <laughs> That's rad. Yeah, you know, I've been focusing <clears throat> in general uh, – you know, just on a lot of new tricks, stuff that I picked up in Thailand, stuff that I, I had been working on kind of from fight to fight. But um, without the layoff, I don't know that I would have had the time to really explore too much of it because you're kind of always just like in the grind getting ready. You've been playing with a lot of stuff around an injury. Um, and then I just kind of, you know, I really liked it. Uh, I fight a little bit different style when I'm standing southpaw. I like to move a little differently and uh, up. so I'm looking forward to trying them out in the fight and uh, hoping I can pull them off. And that's been probably the biggest change in focus for this camp was just, you know, working on some new tricks and seeing what I could do. Must be excited to just go in there and just try it all out. It's kind of, you know, just but, displaying, displaying the painting, everything you've been working on. It's always exciting to see that, to feel that. That's my favorite thing of every fight. You know, every fight that I've ever had, uh, I've always worked something in camp. And then uh, to see if you can really execute it, part of any fight, you know, wh whatever you're working on, just to know that, that you put the work in and you can pull it off under pressure, you know, in the heat of a fight, it's pretty amazing to feel like that. So I'm looking forward to see how much new stuff I can do, but uh, I'm excited. Yeah, man. Uh, so Dominic Platt here, uh, I'm going to read out his message because it's it's taking off our faces. We got to go above it. Uh, it's just essentially, uh, in short, he's, he's been very curious about the long training days as the intensity, you know, goes up. He's like, win, lose, or draw. The quiet after must be crazy after a fight, you know, a lack of direction, focus, but then having to pull yourself around and get back to training. The blue days have always been something of interest to me. Do you guys get that? 
uh, why don't you start off with the answer? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, I think that kind of like, you know, they say like the post-fight depression. I don't know if it's from all the hormones, the adrenaline dump. I think it's like a pretty real thing, you know, win, lose, uh, or draw. A lot of times after a fight, like I just feel spent and down, you know, usually winning helps kind of stave that off. Uh, loss is harder. Uh, and for me, like, I don't know, I'm the kind of person, my brain is just always running. So win or lose, like, like kind of replaying things, you know, going over everything in my head, just, just thinking, but, uh, I don't think the quiet time or the blues is a bad thing. You know, like I, I like to reflect on the fights. I think that time is good for you. You know, you reflect on yourself, uh, whatever you did, you know, mentally, physically in the fight, technically, all those things. And the time can be pretty valuable. And what I do for myself is I kind of just let myself feel however I feel, you know, like if I'm psyched, awesome. If I'm depressed and I want to, you know, hang by myself, I just let it happen for a couple of days. And then I make sure that Monday I'm back in the gym, you know, even if it's doing nothing, if I sit there and jump rope and shadow box, cause I'm beat up or whatever it is, I just get right back to it. And, um, I think that's the best way, like if the post fight blues are an issue or you, you know, have trouble dealing with it, you just got to pull yourself right back out and not give yourself like the choice to kind of stay down like that, you know, cause once you, once you stay down, if you, if you do it for too long, then it, it is hard to pull yourself back out, you know, and I've been there too and learn my lesson. So I cut it off quick nowadays. I think that's awesome advice. Um, the, the letting yourself feel what you're feeling. I, I've been in so many fights, like when you're in the locker room and you're just feeling bored and tired, or maybe you don't even want to be there. And then you're like, Oh, I got to amp myself up and get aggressive. Or maybe you're aggressive and you're like, no, I need to be calm and trying to force a state that you're not really in feel like taking advantage of the energy that you're feeling that day is the only thing that you can do. You know, you, you can't really force anything. It's like forcing an opening that's not there. You know, you're going to expand a lot of energy trying to do something that's just not naturally coming, not naturally flowing. And then because of that, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, I, I remember I had this fight uh, pretty specific. It was a glory rules fight. I was defending my title as an amateur and I didn't want to be there. Uh, my opponent was kind of talking uh, really personal shit, uh, saying stuff like to my girlfriend at the time and things like that. And normally, like, I would want to kill someone for that. Right. But something was up with me that day where I was like, man, I don't want to fight this guy anymore. Like, the more he talked, the less I wanted to fight. And then I ended up just not caring in the fight and taking a lot of damage. But I had so much energy left because I didn't care that he gassed in, he gassed in the third round. And then when I saw him miss a couple things in a row and get really slow, I was like, Oh, Oh, cool. All right. Easy. <laughs> Landed a couple of knees to the body, body shots and kind of finished it off that way. But yeah, that's, I think that's the best advice uh, being able to utilize whatever energy you, you're feeling that day. Have you had that same experience? Yeah, I've definitely had that same experience. You know, I've gone into fights where the same thing and, uh, you know, I just felt like so cold and detached and just like just not fucking excited to be there. And, you know, like even like up till the day of the fight, Wayne's everything. I was like fired up. And then I get there and I'm like, man, like in my mind, I just didn't show up today. Something's not right. But uh, honestly, a couple of those fights, you know, I've had it happen a couple of times and I can think of at least one or two where they were like fantastic performances. Like I went out there just like not uh, trying to psych myself up, not trying to be aggressive and like, you know, make shit happen. And I was like technical. I was smooth. I was slick. And they were great fucking fights. And I was like, it was weird at the time. You're like, man, I was not like in there. I wasn't in it. when yeah. I. But, you know, the fight went on and things started happening happening and uh nowadays i just kind of let myself you know go with whatever's going on and um i think it's just a good way to be in general you know you, you don't want to fight those things it's easy to think as a fighter that if you're like feeling anything like that like you're being a pussy or or just something's wrong like ah, i'm a fucking bitch like i fucked up what am i doing eh, you, you're gonna feel things you know and you just it's better to let yourself feel them and then deal with it as it comes and just roll with it than it is to fight it back and like, you know, get tired, create tension, uh, get, get all like, you know, uh, worked up about it. That's just life. 
you know? You know, one of my clients recently, she, she just fought last weekend and she's fighting two weeks in a row, kind of taking over, uh, the, the modeling, the example, you know, just back to back. And she, she looks up, up to cowboy and cowboy. I mean, is very open. I feel like a lot of fighters are being a lot more open about their kind of journeys to the ring and everything, because at the end of the day, none of it fucking matters. It's just the performance and what you do in there. So whatever I speak, whatever you talk, like once you're in the ring, that's really all it is. So I I feel like in both senses. (laughs) Yeah. So I feel like in both senses, um, you know, if, if you say something negative, you know, even to yourself, it's all good once you get in there. Uh, there's, I mean, Kirian talks about uh, Miriam Nakamoto, like one of the greatest female fighters of all time, just crying and saying, like, I can't do this. And then just going in there and winning a world title and knocking the girl out in, in the first couple of rounds. Yeah, it's crazy. So, uh, yeah, she and then she and uh, my girl uh, ended up winning the fight. And she's fighting again uh, next week. Um, has a great support team great boyfriend, good coach. And then, you know, I'm there more like on the tactical, very technical side of things. And uh, she, she voiced that what some people would view as weakness and then ended up taking the win and then taking another fight a week later. So, yeah. And then the same thing goes when, when you're talking shit, I feel like, Um, you know, like people talk shit, like the other person, you can't take it personally because everyone needs to feel confident for the fight. Everyone's going to say things to feel confident and it is what it is. But like once the fight happens, you know, that, you know, that's the result. That's the only objective thing that you can really look at. So can't take, I I don't take things personally, you know, like people are like, yo, did you see what was on uh, your opponent's Facebook after the fight, before the fight, things like that. I, I honestly have zero clue. You know, I talk and I post my interviews and things like that. Half the time I don't even watch what I said in those interviews. It's just what I felt at the moment. So I'm just honest with it. And then post fight, man, I'm looking at the next opponent. I don't, like, I really don't know what he's saying, nor does it really, does it, does it really matter? <laughs> it, it really doesn't. Performance in the ring matters. Yeah, that's the only thing that matters. I don't, I'm like you, I don't pay attention to any of that. The guys can talk all the shit they want. I don't like to do it because I don't like to be a dick. Uh, and I just don't involve myself. But if they want to talk trash, by all means, psych yourself up, you know? I've kind of myself become comfortable uh, going into fights, like, you know, not, sometimes even not feeling confident and not because, like, I'm afraid of the other guy or anything like that. Like, that ah, shit just went wrong, you know? But, you're like, I'm there to fight, so maybe I'm not feeling that confident this fight or this time, this particular day. It happens, you know, but eh, whatever. You're going out there to do a job. And, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm able to get the job done no matter how I'm feeling. So I don't I don't think, you know, if you got to psych yourself up, do it. I, if you're that kind of fighter, I don't have a problem with it. Most people don't. But, you know, I think people should learn to just be comfortable being uncomfortable, you know. You're not always going to feel like an animal. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge thing. What you just said right there. Uh just whatever you're feeling, whoever you are, whatever works for you. I feel like a lot of people say, you know, well, like this top fighter, you know, they're really relentless. They play mind games and they're at the top. You know, obviously this is a thing that works. And it could be common, you know, there could be multiple fighters at at the time that are doing that. But let's take Joanna as an example. You know, like she she played those mind games. She was killing people back and forth. And you're like, all right, that's the thing that works. But then you get the polar opposite. Rose Namajunas comes in and she's just kind of quiet. She's super nice. You know, she's she seems kind of delicate. And then boom, knockout, boom. And then technically picks her apart in the second fight um, on, the, on the boxing side, at least. And you're like, Okay, that's what works. Like, yeah. no, it's no, it's what worked for that fighter, and then it's what worked for the fighter before that. So it's like the shit talking works for that guy. The shit yeah. not talking shit works for that guy. Being super aggressive works for this guy. Being real mellow, chilled back, you know, maybe stoic works for this person. You have to figure out, you know, throughout your fights, and that's why I always tell people, you know, to stay amateur as long as possible. Is that's where you get to figure it out. You get to play with it. Once you go pro, m- maybe a little bit, but mm-hmm. when, once you get to the big shows, like there, there's no 
figuring things out in a three round glory fight. You know what I'm saying? So it's, you, you got to know by then, like yeah. am, am I best this way? Is this me? What, what is me? It's, it's like a transition period when people get out of college, right? It's like, who am I? What am I doing with my life? What, you know, what is my purpose? Yep. But that's such a big part of fighting. I mean, like you, you got to find out your style. You got to find out what works for you and you got to find out who the fuck you are, like as a fighter and as a person, because if you don't know that when you're going into the fight, I mean, like, how can you possibly be confident or, or anything like that if you don't even know what you're about when you're in there? You know, it's uh, it's it's pretty wild. It is. But I, I agree with your advice. People should stay amateur as long as they possibly can. They should figure themselves out. They should figure out their style. They should figure out how they got to be before a fight, during a fight, after a fight. You got to figure out all those or else you're, you're in for a tough career, you know? And it's tough enough. <laughs> you don't want to make it harder on yourself. <laughs> it sucks, man. I love it, but it, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> Professional fighting is a motherfucker, man. Oh, We're kind of- Oh, hundred percent. How are you able to, you're still working with clients right now. Cause you, you were with some clients and training before we got on the podcast. That's why you're still at the gym. So how are you able to balance the two? Cause honestly I used to do it kind of really mess. Um, Oh my God, I'm going to show you this thing. So I heard on uh, Joe Rogan. I don't know if you get elbow tendonitis, but this is an issue that a lot of fighters talk about that also hold pads that hit pads, hold pads. See this little <clears throat> dildo right here? <laughs> that thing looks like fun, huh? Oh, yeah. It looks like a good time. It's ribbed, too. You see that? Yeah. Oh, for for uh, pressure <laughs> points. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep wiggling it right here for everyone. I think it's um, good. It's for wrist, finger, and thumb strength, and then for uh, elbow. So, like, being able to kind of, like, twist it really engages – the elbow joint and then i don't know if anyone's going to be able to see like if if you put it in between like the bicep and the elbow it's kind of like you know foam roller is way too big to be able to do something like that but being able to twist it inside the elbow and press it in pressure off like the joint capsule and stuff in there like relieve yeah yeah so i have i mean like i touch the inside of my elbow here uh, on my forearm and just the whole shit locks up. Or if I press on the ligament underneath my elbow or the te- yeah. or the tendon, and the whole thing just gets like a shock. <laughs> so you know, but, I get it in my shoulders, unfortunately, because I've I've always had bad shoulders, and uh, my elbows are pretty good. But when I hold hold a lot of pads, fucking wrecked. So for shoulders, I found that the bands so this is from theraband as well but it's called the from theraband it's called the flex bar uh but the therabands themselves just like kind of like opening up the entire capsule letting that blood flow in there that's what i found to be most helpful yeah even days off like sundays whatever i still get in some band work and mobility it's the only thing if i skip a couple days or a week my shoulders are right back to trash. I need like that constant blood flow in there on recovery days and to get some mobility and range of motion or else I'm just a mess. So, <laughs> but so how do you work it with your clients uh, leading up to the fight? Cause right now we're about a week or two away. Yeah, probably after today. I mean, I had a bunch of clients today. I held some pads for all of them, but uh, probably after today, I'll just cut out pad work. It'll be mostly bag work, like light technical drilling and stuff like that more low impact stuff so I can rest my shoulders and elbows and joints. <clears throat> but usually like, you know, I, I do it right up until fight week before I, I start to make a lot of concessions. Cause I have fun training with them too. Like I like my guys, yeah. I, I want to hold pads uh, and I want to, you know, make sure things are good. I don't like to just stand there and watch them hit the bag, especially cause the bag is, it's not always the best, you know, like uh, you told me the same thing. I can't help myself sometimes. I'm like, I got a whole patch for this guy or else I'm going to fucking drive myself. Nuts. So, Yeah, I've been that way. And then since we had that conversation uh, this past week, be just coming back from the fight, coming back from L.A., um, I've actually gotten really creative with the drills that I'm doing with my guys. So that's one thing it's done is just gotten me more creative, finding different ways to teach things versus 
always holding pads to teach the same thing. And it also gives me that third person point of view where I get to see it from a different plane and see different detail versus seeing them straight in front of me. Yeah, you miss you do miss stuff on pads sometimes too. It's like it can be the best way to fix things and it could be an easy way to miss stuff, you know? So I like I like being the third guy a lot of times. Like but uh you know when it works it works. You gotta figure out what works at the time. Super excited. Lion fight, April twenty first against Eric. Is it Rocha? Roca? Rocha, Roca. I have no idea. Something yeah. of that sort. Uh his coming off a knockout win. Um, so that's impressive. Uh not against someone of your level, but um, you know, he himself has you know similar experience to yourself so it's a pretty exciting matchup seems like the card is rather stacked yeah i think so i know um there's a title fight for the the muay thai grand prix belt at my weight i think between uh jafar toshev and uh carlton loot so that's kind of exciting i'm looking forward to watching that <laughs> no, i believe the shevchenko sister is on there as well I didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we got some superstars in the building, and uh, it's going to be exciting to definitely see you back in there, being able to elbow people, being able to drive those knees in, use the long guard, oh, use all God. these different <laughs> techniques. Man, it's going to be super exciting. And then, uh, so what's after this? What's 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 next? I mean, I I never look past it, so I don't ex I don't expect any kind of answer. <laughs> you know, for me, um. I just want to fight again as soon as possible. Yeah. But, uh, you know, nothing announced with Lion Fight. Nothing really lined up. So we'll, we'll just see what happens. As soon as they ask me to fight, I'm game. Uh, you know, I got a whole bunch of stuff I got to take care of after this fight anyway. So a couple of weeks at least I'll, I'll need, and then I'm good to go. And I just want to try and stay busy because the last year or so with the, uh, with the layoff, you know, because of some family stuff and all that, it, it's a long time to not fight and I've been bored and been itching to get back. So I don't want to lose momentum once I gain it. And I just want to keep going. Yeah, that's definitely big. I'm definitely looking forward to moving to Thailand and fighting people that know, don't know who the fuck I am. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to old school, man, because, yep. because I, I definitely thought about it before. It's like, it's almost fighting for free out there, but yeah, uh, just for the sake of experience, I feel like I'll be able to work things again and then just be able to go in there against guys that don't know who I am to do it old school. You know, we both go in there. We don't know who the fuck, you know, that guy is. He doesn't know who I am. And then we sit next to each other. Have the time you think you're fighting a white person and you're fighting a black guy or a tie. Then you you think you're fighting a tie and you're fighting a white dude. <laughs> it's all over. And I love that. I kind of miss those days, like coming up as an amateur on small yeah. shows show up half the time you show up and it's like a different weight class a different guy and you're like ah whatever let's go i remember as an amateur showing up one time for uh <clears throat> it was supposed to be uh a title no a non-title fight at 145 pounds and i show up and it was a title fight at 155 pounds and i walked in there at like 152 he, i was like i hadn't eaten all day either because i thought i had to make weight i was getting ready to cut he's like no no no, no you're good you're good it's 155 i'm like what it's like, you motherfucker, you couldn't have at least told me that on the ride down so I would have eaten something? But, uh, yeah, it was fun, man. It was always fun. You know, you don't know who you're fighting. You just go and fight. Yeah. There's something bit more professional these days, and uh, <laughs> you know, the opportunities are certainly better, but I think people are missing out when they never got to have that. Like, ah, I don't even know who the fuck this guy is until he jumps over the ropes. I believe it might have been the – I don't know if it was the same show that I met Sean – or it was the one right after it, but it was in the same arena. It was in a arena. It was in the same basketball court. <laughs> and uh, I fought this kid. You know, I've never walked above like low 200s. And uh, it was for the, they're like, oh, this is my first belt. 205, 205 pound belt. Um, I came in, I was like 198. I, I was eating as much as I can because I thought I'm like, man, if I get real big for this fight, I'll have a big advantage if I get real big. But I was like big bloated for no, just sodium <laughs> in my face. I think like 20 pounds went to my face and I was like 198, uh, super top heavy. <laughs> and uh, the other guy, 
I didn't even know until after he weighed in at 222. No one told me that. Then we fought, and uh, he was this, like, real brawlic, tattooed guy. So I'm kind of sitting there like, all right, I just got to, I don't know, (laughs) force myself up. I don't know what I'm going to do to this guy. I'm just going to clinch him or do what – that's all I knew. I'm like, the big guys just clinch him. And just take away that all that power swinging through your gloves, and then uh, so so it's like I was scared, and then after the fight, uh, I actually ended up cracking his rib like forty seconds in. So like right when the fight started, he threw a cross, and I just countered it with a knee, and just cracked his rib, and you can his hand dropped, and I just kept teeing off until I hit the body again, and uh, he turned away, and the they ended the fight. So it was like a minute thirty into the first round, and. Uh, he came out in after he's like, man, just I was scared to fight you. You're like this tall, lanky dude, this and this. I'm like, man, yeah, I'm six four, lanky, but you know, like 198. You're like six feet, but 220 something pounds, trying to get down to 205. But it's yeah, exciting, man. It, it was, yeah, definitely a fun time. And it's, it's same same thing in Thailand. So I'm kind of looking forward to uh, getting that old school back and then getting back into the swing of things. Yeah, that's awesome. It's going to be fun. When exactly are you going to Thailand? How soon? So I'm getting the facial surgery first and just going through appointments currently. Um, um, old lady boys, huh? <laughs> <laughs> who knows who knows what else i'm gonna add to it <laughs> definitely polish off this nose man make me look cute again make me the most handsome neck nation member and content creator and then from the front, <laughs> i'm gonna steal that title from you we're gonna make a poll after i'm after i'm healed up and then yeah from there probably beginning of june i have this plan of doing two weeks disconnected hopefully it pans through i've been telling myself i'm going to do this every trip to thailand and then i'm i end up uh going to thailand training camp and going to bangkok and helping teach and host and taking opportunities but just you know just just need to do things for myself (laughs) this one i just need to do it for myself i just need me time you know (laughs) maybe yeah so yeah, go go up to Chiang Mai. I I feel like that's more of like a tranquil area for me out there in the mountains. It just the energy there, um, and disconnect for about two weeks, and then from there just try to get a fight, perhaps travel a little bit for a week or two, and then get back to the island because uh, Sean and I are having the Thailand training camp going on, and uh, we're co-oping the Limitless Project coming together with Thailand training camp and we're going to be teaching and uh, fighting side by side with everyone July and August. So yeah. Anyone listening, thailandtrainingcamp.com slash summer. We have a couple spots left. Definitely going to be limited, but it's going to be a real fun time. Chris has trained there as well. He's trained at diamond. And I feel like we just want to change up the vibe. Just real. uh, There's a number of fighters coming from California, Oregon, uh east coast west coast around the world so i feel like this one is just going to be a different type of energy because i mean the the trainers are already you know champion level trainers so it just depends on who you are as an individual yeah those the trainers at diamond are awesome man like uh what's his name mon santo those guys are great fantastic trainers we're amazing fighters they're fun to work with so I think if you guys got a bunch of fighters there while you're there, it's going to be a good camp. I'm a little jealous I can't be there. <laughs> Maybe by the end of it, you'll be able to make it. By squeezing another fight soon, I'll have enough extra money. I'll just dip. I'll come yeah. to town. Tell everybody here to suck it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. How, do you have a Mon story? Do you have a story with Mon? No, you know, I didn't get any of the Epic Yoda stuff. Sean warned me oh. about it or told me about it uh, endearingly. And then I got there waiting for it, and I just hit pads with him. He was totally normal. I'm like, ah, I didn't get any of this stuff. I hear about the rocks and all the other stuff, and I'm like, that sounds rad. I want that. And then I didn't get it. It's fucked up. Have I told you uh, not just the tip story? No. (laughs) It sounds great, though. (laughs) So... The first time I ever went, so mind you, I'm super inexperienced. And I'm like uh, maybe around nine fights as an amateur training for like two years, maybe. And 
I, I went out to Thailand and this is my first time working with him. And his, he's like Mr. Miyagi, you know, just like you do how you feel and you feel how you move through the air. Movement is key. And you're like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> I remember I was kicking and, um, you know, in the beginning, you kind of just want to get your knee there. Like you think about what you're hitting with versus the actual movement of like what makes sense. Like you're like, oh, I need to hit the knee to the pad and your hip could be like, oh, you're sitting on your ass sticking out or like you kick and your ass is sticking back as long as your shin hits the pad, you know? Yeah. And he just keeps looking at me as trying to different ways of like explaining and he just like, I'm not getting it. And he's like, <sighs> And then he, I knee again, and and he just like puts the pads behind his back. He's like, "How you fuck?" And I'm, <laughs> I was like, Ex "Excuse me." He's like, "How you fuck?" I'm like, "Did you just ask me how I, I, did you say fuck? Did you ask me how I fuck?" And he's like, "Yes, yeah, how you fuck? Just the tip." I'm like. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't fuck with just the tip. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't. I was like, I don't do that. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, okay. So you need like you fuck. And I'm like, like, can you further explain this in detail to me? This yeah. the secret you like you fuck technique. And he's like, he's like, no, just the tip. You don't put in little bit and pull all the way back. He's like, hip all the way deep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's awesome. it's all the way, and I and yeah, it's stuck ever since. It's stuck ever since now. Yeah, and, and, and then they they call me Reaper. That's yeah. why they call me Reaper for a reason. Oh man, that is awesome. Hopefully, I'll get some of that when I get over there next year. <laughs> I want the uh, Mr. Miyagi experience. I feel robbed and cheated. Uh, uh, you already knee like you fuck and you kick like you fuck already. So you're not going to no. get those lessons, I guess. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine also, uh, she, she was training under him and I get this call. Like this is after I already left Thailand and she was training with them and she calls me. She's from South Africa. <laughs> Paul, man. And I'm like, what? I was on pads with Mon today. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> She's like, fucking man. I threw rocks for 30 fucking minutes, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sean told me about his rock throwing experience. That's pretty fucking funny. You know, it's little things that just kind of make you make sense. And, and she was so pissed off about it because she never even got pad work. She just got throwing rocks for like three classes. And then like five months later, I get... <laughs> a voice text so foreigners voice text a lot i don't know if you know this i i didn't i never voice text you know the like voice feature i feel like americans don't do that oh, yeah. but a bunch, all the foreigners they they do it whoever i know from different countries so you guys are weird <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of cool it's it's a little more intimate you know like when someone wishes you a happy birthday and it's like a recording and you know they kind of sing it to you you're like oh shit like that's super nice I take it back. We're the weirdos. <laughs> we're a bunch of yeah. Kind of, like, we're kind of all about ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Pros and cons, as we said before. But yeah, I get the voicemail, and it's just a message. It's like, <sighs> fuck, man. I get what he was saying now. Like five months later, it just stuck. It was like, fuck. I get what he was saying. <laughs> five months later. Yeah, but the show. I mean, it does makes sense with throwing with the shoulder i mean there's a lot of fighters that i notice um you know they have tension before they throw and then they let go when you throw a rock you need to be loose throughout the entire motion and it has to follow through all the way versus like being tight and then pulling back tight yeah, you know yeah. just putting That's the true. tip in it's an incredibly hard thing to teach people too you know everybody wants to hit super hard and they just want to like fucking flexing to lose power so that's a the rock throwing is an interesting little thing that's funny i dig it we're gonna, gonna have all my uh, i'm gonna have to catch him i'm gonna like i try to catch a video of him before and and it's and it's hard i, I need to catch a video because it's such he's such a unique trainer and i feel like it, it hasn't like transcribed itself into like general public or on the videos or anything like that because I, i've never i thought that was the 
the real thing. Like people are like Mr. Miyagi. And I thought that's what Thailand was like until I started traveling to like a hundred different camps. Yep. Yeah. There's no Mr. Miyagi so far that I've met. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, man. Looking forward to the fight. Awesome chatting with you. Uh, we'll get together soon. Uh, some exciting things are on the horizon. Actually today I just posted a technique video with Chris. So if you guys want to check it out on my YouTube channel, you can go to Moisa Athlete on Facebook as well or MoisaAthlete.com. Uh, badass Superman punch. Not really a Superman, but like more Thai style. A lot more vicious. None of that MMA striking uh, bullshit. Like real, real, real <laughs> traditional Muay Thai. <laughs> Are you even a crew bro to teach this kind of stuff? Oh, fuck, bro. I'm fucking paid certified. Paid certified crew. You got you, you got the certificate. Yeah, I bought it from uh, Master Toddy. No, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's fine. Right, that's, I didn't mean to do that. I take that back. And kind nah, of. It's, I think <laughs> everyone knows. Just having yeah. fun, man. Uh, on the uh, videos, we have two more coming out for that, and then we're going to be working on a course. It's going to be super exciting. So um, that that's definitely in the works as I make my way over to Thailand. I want to make it as high quality as possible, put as much into it as possible, investing a good amount of money and a good amount of time into it as I'm going to recover from the injury. So just make sure you guys head over at thailandtrainingcamp.com slash summer. You check out Lion Fight Promotions. You check out the streams. You check out all of uh, Chris's stuff. It's just Chris Mouseri on everything with it. So Mouseri M A U C E R I on yeah. Instagram, all the other good stuff, and you can follow his journey. One of the most technical fighters. You can definitely find him. Oh, even on Lawrence Kenshin's page, all over social media. If you just YouTube, it's a great example and technical study for everyone. So appreciate you having on and coming on the show. Oh yeah, Muay guys. Muay Thai guy. Muay Thai guy. <laughs> I never even addressed that. Sean isn't here today. The Muay Thai guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking that his is... personality over, man. I'm taking his personality. He, uh, his, his laptop fried out. So, yeah. One man oh, show. Picking up the slack. Now let's just kill him. He's fine. We don't need Sean. Well, you need Sean. So. You need Sean to yeah. to land that liver shot. Like in that Lord, yeah. Don't check out Lawrence Kenshin's <laughs> breakdown of two versus one against the one <laughs> multi giant. Yeah, you're lucky I'm not in Thailand this time because we're getting your ass next time. Steve D. Wang said, Yo, what up, fam? Can you message me the info, Chris? Me and my girl want to come support you, fam. Oh, I got Steve. I got you, bro. There you go. All right. Beautiful. So thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast, leave us a five-star review. And then this upcoming Saturday, 8 PM Easter, make sure you're still looking at a lot of our social media because we're going to be having a supermodel and Muay Thai fighter Mia Tang on the podcast. We're going to be interviewing her, Sean and I, and it's going to be a fun one to listen to. So make sure you check it out. Big guests, big things coming up. Exciting stuff, exciting times. Have a beautiful day, my lovely Nakamoy Nation members. Peace out, everybody.